All right, welcome to the first of its kind, World Changing Manufacturers Network. Lisa Ryan has her ears to the ground and her heart in the game. Get ongoing education and new connections right here with Lisa and the Manufacturers Network. Buckle your seat, listen, and spread the word. Here's Lisa. Hey, it's Lisa Ryan. Welcome to the Manufacturers Network podcast. I'm here today with Darren Mitchell. Darren is a global manufacturer for the past 24 years of highway equipment. Last year, he developed an online training platform for manufacturing businesses to find best practices from experts all over the world. Darren, welcome to the show. Awesome. Thank you for having me, Lisa. It's a pleasure to be here. So share with us a little bit about your background and what led you to doing what you're doing in manufacturing. Yep. Um, So again, a global manufacturer of big highway equipment. So if anybody out there listening right now has ever been stuck in traffic and you've complained that the equipment uh, up ahead is blocking your way or making you late, I'm officially the guy to blame. (laughs) So we we built the equipment that uh, either was building roads or it was in the mines or hauling agricultural product, but uh, big highway trailers for hauling big bulky things. And we did that across North America, Australia, New Zealand, Middle East, South Korea, and Europe. And so, and why did you choose that industry? What led you into highway equipment to begin with? 25 years ago, I met my business partner who was an engineer. He uh, said he was going to start making these highway trailers. And I said, for the love of Mary, please do not ever do that. And he said, uh, no, no, I think it's a good idea. And I said, listen, our biggest competitors are out of Ohio. They are vertically and horizontally integrated. They own their suppliers. They are next to the customers. The customers come and pick up the product from the factory and they're happy with five to 9% margin. Literally day one, if we tried to compete from a rural and remote community, We've already lost just on the cost of getting materials to our factory. There is no hope in hell of us ever succeeding competing against someone who has hundreds of millions of CapEx spending. They're fully automated. They're competing on volume. They're integrated into the supply chain. We would never, ever be able to win. And obviously something changed. (laughs) Uh, No, he went ahead and uh, started it anyway. And then Uh called me uh, a few months later and he said, "Uh, I'm in deep help. (laughs) Oh, okay. (laughs) (laughs) So I told you not to do this. Mm -hmm. So um, we started getting innovative immediately, understanding what we were up against and not doing what our competitors were doing. So one of the things that we did is we built a lot of innovation into the product that we were able to ask for a premium. So being from a place where you're removed from your supply chain or your customer base, you have to ask for a premium. So we built a lot of things, moving parts. The products were able to do things that our competitors couldn't do because they didn't have the capacity for it or And when I would meet with my competitors, they would say, I hate you. And I would say, well, I like you. Why do you hate me? And they would say, I hate you because it's hard to copy you. So we have massive assembly lines set up in our factory, but the way you've innovated with your products, it's hard to copy that in a massive assembly line where you would put out 10,000, 20,000 you know, products a year. So the first thing that we did was we innovated to make the product more valuable to the customer so we could uh, charge a premium. And, uh, and that's how we started growing the business and understanding that we didn't want to compete against the mass. We wanted to skim the cream off the top and make sure that we could show that value to the customer so we could charge that premium for the product. So that was the, that was the first step in, uh, in what we did for the, for the growth of the business. And so how did you decide what um, to add to your products to make it premium? Was that in uh, researching the industry, talking to customers, kind of taking a wild guess? How did you decide and what would be an example of 
you know, a, an innovation that you put in a product that your competitors couldn't duplicate? Uh, the quickest thing that we did is we, uh, we, I spent a lot of time sleeping on airport floors. We spent a lot of time in a very senior le leadership position. We spent a lot of time with customers. So we would say, what, what features do you like? What features do you don't like? What can it do? What can it do? What could it do to make you more money? And how can we become more valuable in it? but we wouldn't get that feedback if we were just living in a rural location. We actually had to spend that time with the customer to do that. And what we ended up doing is our competitors would make these big dump trailers that go up in the air and the materials fall out of the back. We ended up putting a conveyor belt in the bottom of the trailer that you could have um, a driver that's relatively inexperienced. They turn on the trailer and it unloads without going up in the air and have that threat of falling over. And so that the the addition of the moving parts nobody uh, nobody found it fun to copy that because it interfered with the manufacturing process and again we got good at it and it was a level of complexity that our competitors found it difficult to copy. And was it also because they your competitors had been doing it the same way for so long that they didn't have the flexibility that you had as a newer company? Did that play anything into it? Absolutely. So, you know, most manufacturers are set up for efficiency and not effectiveness. And we've seen this lately with disruptions in supply chains is everything goes really, really well when it goes really, really well. <laughs> and as a manufacturer, sometimes you've got things so efficient it's hard to be flexible. So you always have to remember that you have to build that flexibility into your, you know, your innovation and your factory and your supply chain and your staff. You have to build that flexibility, otherwise you can get caught flat-footed. Absolutely. Well, one of the things that we have talked quite pretty extensively about is your focus on culture. And that's pretty much what you're known for in everything you do. And you kind of gave me a little teaser about you were going to share some ways to increase culture by 33%. So mm -hmm. tell us more. <laughs> Well, I'm glad I caught your attention. <laughs> so I think 33% is a very interesting number because it does something to the human brain. And one of the things you need to think about as a manufacturer is before you that little BS detector goes off in your head, is you need to think about 33% compared to what? And I would suggest that if companies out there are seriously in, um, interested in a very genuine and tactical way to improve their company culture today, they should reach out to someone like Lisa Ryan <laughs> who can say, <laughs> let's get a base level of where to start because a lot of companies don't even know where they're at today versus how do they improve from where they're at. So because we were you know, obviously limited on time and we can't ramble about things for hours, I have three tips today, divide them by 10. You've got, you know, basically 11.1% uh, for each tip that you <laughs> can you use go. to improve your culture. Number one is in a leadership position, you have to, when you're a leader, you gave up a lot of your rights and responsibilities as an employee within the business. And as a leader, you have to own the fact that you never let your team fill in the blanks. Everybody who shows up every day who's worth their salt that comes to the business believes in something beyond a paycheck. They believe that they're wearing a team jersey and they're part of something that they gain additional value in their lives beyond a paycheck. Your responsibility as a leader within the business is don't let them fill in the blanks. And what I mean by that is as a leader, you always need to be front and center explaining what the future looks like and what our place as a team, where do we fit into that future? What it is not is you never, ever lie to people because if you do that once and you candy coat shit, they'll never come back. <laughs> you need right. to be honest. You need to give people that clear indication of what the future looks like of the business and where they fit into that. And 
I'll give you a really good example. And this is the bad news. So during COVID, because we always like these heroic stories of good things, but during COVID, and that's, I, I'm sick and tired of talking about it. I had 130 employees who even the team leads were so panicked and frustrated. They were getting it from work. They were getting it from CNN and they were getting it from their spouses at home. They were beyond their capacity to handle the situation. Guess who else was? Me. <laughs> right. But I gave up that right to fall into that mode when I accepted the mantle of the leadership position. So what I did was two times a week for the first eight months of the pandemic, I would break everybody into small groups and stand in front of everyone and say, this is what I know. This is what's happening with the business. I understand everybody has concerns, but here's what my guarantee is. I'm going to keep standing in front of you until we get to a better day. I will not candy coat anything in front of you, but I do know this one thing. You are a world-class team acting like a world-class team today. And I have the utmost respect for my coworkers who come to work every day and continue to conduct themselves as such. And I said that twice a week for eight months and I would always give them an update. And what it did is it gave them the reassurance that someone had the fingers on the pulse of their future. So when your home life was unstable, and a lot of us went through that, you knew you had some stability when you came to work. Someone was thinking actively about your future and where you fit into it. So the first rule would be is as a leader, you can't abdicate conversation. Your job in that leadership position is to talk about the future and that the place that we as the employees of the business fit into that to give people that sense of accomplishment. And all too often, we, we tend to just announce the big things and the good things. You have to announce all things because when people, when you're absent, nobody fills in the space with positive news. Right, exactly. No human ever does that. So take that opportunity to be that leader that they're looking for in that space. Yeah. Well, and the funny thing is, we've heard it so many times, it's almost cliche that people don't leave their job, they leave their boss. I mean, companies will say, oh, yeah, Joe left to go somewhere else to make more money. No, if Joe was happy, he would have never left. But there was something about the leadership, the boss not being transparent, because like you just said, that when the grapevine is going and people don't know what's going on, they're going to make stuff up. And what they're making up are not happy thoughts. They're making up, they're justifying, they're looking the way that leader is looking, they're looking at their expressions on their face. So just that uh, getting in front of people, knowing that your employees aren't always going to like what you have to say, but the fact that you're being straight with them twice a week for eight months, it's probably interesting as those, as your employees were at the bar on Fridays with their, uh, with their buddies talking about work, their friends are probably saying, our boss, I don't even know where our boss is. He disappeared. I don't know what's going on with the company. So there's that level of vulnerability that you show that you're willing to be transparent with them, but that communication that really builds those relationships. That's definitely key. Thanks. Um, and I screwed up a lot of stuff too. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you're segueing very nice into the uh, second point is who is the boss? What we found a lot of times in our culture development is the the senior leadership of the business has a certain level of influence on the culture, but those senior leaders need to realize the managers and team leaders actually have a bigger influence on your culture. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we did to empower our team leads is a really good example of this that I was proud of is that every month uh, we would set out monthly production objectives as a team. And we would pick a number and say, we're, we're going to get 30 units out the door this month. And if 
all of the employees succeeded in getting those 30 units out the door every month, high quality with all the needs, features and benefits that the customers were looking for. Uh, we gave them a hundred dollar bill. Mm. Now, someone could say, hey, Darren, uh, tax issues. And I went, oh, shut up. I don't care. Um, <laughs> um, so very, we were very specific in it. What we would do is I would go to the bank and pick up a stack of $100 bills. And I would hand those to the team leads before the meeting. I never, ever handed out a $100 bill. Only if we hit our objectives the team leads would meet with their teams to say, hey, we hit our objectives. And only the team lead was allowed to pass the bill and shake the hand. Mm. And I was never allowed to touch that. I was the guy who was saying, here we are. This is where we're going. And the team leads took that personally. So that was a, you know, except for the tax issue, um, that was a really good incentive because it was more powerful than giving them a thousand dollar bonus. The act of doing this and shaking hands and making eye contact and saying, thank you to one of your coworkers. You made a difference this month. We turned that into ritual and it, it was a very positive effect on the business. So the second thing is if you want to improve your culture is find ways to empower your team leads because they have more influence over the masses than you do in a senior leadership position because they're the, they're the direct reports uh, that are coming out of the business. Yeah, and a lot of times too, we had talked about the difference between $1,000 and $100. When you start get people think that it's all about the money and you just illustrated that so beautifully because a lot of times, say you were, you had a really great month and you gave everybody a thousand dollars, they would be like, well, you know, and the next month it goes down to a hundred. Now you have people complaining, well, how come we only got a hundred this month? And it takes away the magic. It's like a $25 gas card given to somebody, catching them in the act of doing something right is not going to upset anybody else because you're being recognized. So it's actually the, the smaller gifts. And what even makes that, you could probably have done the exact same thing with a $50 bill because it's the eye contact and the handshake and that personal connection that your leaders are, your managers are showing their employees, I see you, I appreciate you. And it also sounds like you're getting them to all buy into the system because a lot of times you, you see it all the time that there's some managers that are really, really great with their people and some that just aren't. And those ones that have the departments with the high turnover, but you're saying, well, I can't get rid of them. They're our highest producing department, even though they have 100% turnover. And it's like, no, you have to get rid of those toxic managers or train them or do something, but bringing everybody into the team, having that meeting. And, like, and I also like what you said about ritualizing the experience, keeping it consistent and coming together in celebration. So many good tips in that, in uh, idea number two. Thanks. And number three, it is the most uncomfortable thing a manufacturer will ever do. <laughs> I'm gonna ask every manufacturer out there today to make a video. And last year alone, we had 6 million views on YouTube. And this is how people found out who we are, why they should trust us, and why they should work with us. Hmm. And we use those videos, not needs, features, benefits, product. <laughs> we created those videos to show who we are, and it's very easy to do business with us. And guess who the star of the videos were? The employees. You got it. <laughs> I would go and pluck out employees randomly from the floor. And I would say, you're a star. And they would go, oh, Darren, are you going to be the other way? You're going to be <laughs> awesome. And we did so many fun, silly, serious, uh, different things with the employees. Like one, we filled up a trailer with uh, water in the middle of winter. And we just opened the tailgate and dumped it on one of our employees sitting 
in a, in a little Mr. Turtle pool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, we were trying to show how watertight it was. We took four of our most husky employees and they wore their wives' dresses and wigs. And we said, the new models are coming. <laughs> oh boy. Okay. <laughs> and all, all silly tongue in cheek stuff. But here's what happened. One, the rest of the world started saying, you look like you're fun people to do business with. You look like you're real, honest human beings. And secondly, those employees not only started becoming transmitters for the business, they also took those videos home to show their children and their spouses, this is what I do every day. Mm -hmm. Now the business became part of the family household. So mom just doesn't get up at 6 a.m. every morning to go and do something. She actually does something pretty cool because I just seen her on this little device in my back pocket. Wow. Well, and the other thing that that's great for, and I talk about the power of video all the time, um, when we're looking at such a tough labor market right now to attract employees, they're checking you out online and they want to see, do you have people who look like me? Does it look like it's a fun place to work? I mean, if you have nothing online and all you have is a bunch of negative reviews on glassdoor.com that you've never even answered to, the, the chance of that employee ever even filling out an application goes down. So it sounds like you're increasing your business because it looks like you're fun to do business with. But just as far as from a recruitment standpoint, making it easier, but also you think about one of your employees uh, going home and telling his or her spouse that, hey, you know what? I'm going to leave this job. I'm, I'm tired of it. You can't leave that. You're a YouTube video star. That's exactly <laughs> yeah. what happened. So, and, so when, and that little transmitter, they were able to send that to their family and friends. And there was a very specific recipe on the people I would pick for the videos because I wanted them to share that with family and friends because I was starting to get applications from those family and friends uh, that the video was sent to going, hey, I want to be happy like he seems to be happy. Mm -hmm. Great. But we'll also give you a paycheck and train you and do all those good things too. Yeah. But it will treat the, you like a human. Yeah. And the thing is, and it sounds like you just brought in your phone. It's not like you brought in a huge production team and did a big fancy schmancy thing. I mean, and you could have, but just that when people think about the technology that we have, I mean, I just got the iPhone 13 Pro. So I have more power in my hand right now than most movie theaters did you know, 10 years ago. So it, it's easy to do. It's just the point of doing it. And the, uh, the recipe, you, you hit the nail on the head, Lisa, is the recipe is forget the flashy stuff. It doesn't work. It sets off our BS detector. Mm -hmm. So grab your phone and be authentic and sincere. And people will share that with you. Yeah. So out of everything that you've seen and you've done with your, uh, with your culture over the years, what's your favorite thing? If you were to give some advice or an idea that somebody listening today could start to implement immediately, what would that be? Um, if you want the most sincere answer, you know, the most heartfelt answer uh, you could get from me is after, you know, after 23 years, especially for the last five years financially, we were in pretty good shape. And when you're not under duress as a manufacturer, because if you're always under stress, you tend to take it out on your people. So we found ourselves in an okay spot. We were in a safe spot and we set up a high school education program. Mm. And uh, I watched many of my coworkers graduate and they would say privately to me, thanks, I don't feel like a piece of shit anymore. And I would go, Oh, uh, okay. Um, okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay, good, good. Um, whew, that's deep. <laughs> Was yeah. it expected? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, uh, I even now take so much, uh, pleasure out of thinking about those memories where someone, you know, I was fortunate enough. I graduated high school to see one of my coworkers associate that with, I actually feel like a human being today that made me feel awesome. 
And that was one of the best things that I think we did that I was probably most proud of. Like we did crazy things like putting on typing courses. Right. (laughs) You're a manufacturer, why a typing course? Well, guess what? We have a lot of computers on the floor today. They have to type. (laughs) Right, exactly. Yeah. Well, good. Well, Darren, if people did want to connect with you and carry on the conversation, what's the best way for them to do that? And um, how do you work with your clients? I know you also have your your platform for manufacturing masters. So share with us a little bit about that, too. Yeah. So if you're on social media I'm everywhere, the biggest thing is since my manufacturing time, what I realized is, you know, there's still so much power in the cell phone. Everybody has one. And in 23 years, I always ask myself, where do I go for best practice? Who, who do I ask that is going to, you know, who has been there, done that, and who's going to give me an honest answer instead of saying, Darren, you need to buy this machine because I sell this machine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so where do I go to find that best practice? So in the last eight months, uh, what we did is we built an educational training platform And we've so far gone out and gathered over a hundred experts in manufacturing from around the world. Uh, Lisa Ryan is one of them, everyone. Um, (laughs) And what we've asked our experts to do is to give us five, five minute videos on, because manufacturers think in bullet points. (laughs) In this one particular issue, what are the bullet point things I need to do to practice best practice today in my business? So everywhere from how to count your inventory properly, how to get more women in your manufacturing business, how to develop a sustainable manufacturing business, what is the job of the CFO in the manufacturing business? And in 24 years, I never knew. (laughs) So I have somebody who did a video who's been a CFO in manufacturing, who does a video in five minutes saying, Every day, your CFO in manufacturing should be thinking about these four things, period. Stop thinking about 26 spreadsheets. They should be thinking about these four things. So the goal of Manufacturing Masters is to give manufacturers across the globe access to best practice and also access to those experts where they're looking for help implementing some of the solutions in the videos. So... As long as we go forward and we're always very high quality and trusted as a resource, uh, we're just going to keep growing and growing this as a resource for manufacturers across the globe. All right. And how do people get in touch with you? Um, So the best way is to go to manufacturing-masters.com or they can uh, reach me, just go on to anywhere from LinkedIn to Facebook to you name it, we're there. <laughs> All righty. Well, Darren, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on the show today. Awesome. Thank you, Lisa. And I appreciate everything you do as well. Um, you're, you're the expert in culture and manufacturing. And uh, I, I think it's a huge thing that manufacturers need to take a look at what you're doing, because sometimes we get a little too obsessed with process. And we forget that people make processes. So thank you for everything that you do. Oh, you are very welcome. I'm Lisa Ryan, and this is the Manufacturers Network Podcast. We'll see you next time. All right. That was awesome. That was a lot of fun. Thanks. Yeah. You know, I just wanted to make it. Yeah. And I, I didn't mean to, to cut you off between the, the, the three Oh, it was things. great. Yeah. It was I just, perfect. <laughs> okay. I, like the, I like the back and forth. It seems yeah. a little less artificial. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Well, awesome. Well, I, I'm about um, three to four weeks out with my episodes. I actually took um, this last Monday off. I, you know, I tried to guilt myself into getting out an episode, but I am so was so behind on this book and dealing with my uh, issues with an aging father. Thanks for listening. Hey, do me a favor. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and give us a five star rating. Also, feel free to share the podcast with your friends and colleagues so we can grow the network and connect more fantastic folks just like you. You can either go to the website at manufacturers 
www.ashleyshaw-network.com or share the podcast on your LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or wherever you and your industry friends hang out. The bigger and faster we grow this network, the stronger and deeper community we will have. I appreciate you. Thank you.